Good afternoon. I am Deb Otis. I'm the Director of Research and Policy at FairVote. Thank you all for joining today's very timely conversation on ranked choice voting at the Oscars. Of course, you movie buffs know we are in the thick of awards season and the Oscars are coming up next Sunday, March 10th. So this webinar is a little bit different from our usual ones because we get to talk movies. Uh, but if you want the usual flavor, you can find all sorts of webinars, research briefs, and more on our YouTube and other social channels. So do check those out. For today, back to our topic at hand. The Oscars have used ranked choice voting to pick best picture winners since 2009. And they've actually used the proportional form of RCV uh, for nominations dating all the way back to the 1930s. So it's a great example of how ranked choice is used by all kinds of organizations to ensure more voters are represented and identify consensus winners. So today, we are really lucky to have an amazing guest who can share an inside look at ranked choice voting at the Oscars. We're joined by Tom Oyer, formerly with the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Uh, Tom worked there for 16 years, most recently as a senior VP of member relations and awards. And so Tom played a critical role in modernizing the Academy's voting process, including expanding the use of proportional RCV and implementing rules changes in a number of awards categories, and of course, He's a self-described elections nerd. Tom, we're thrilled to have you. Welcome. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I hope you all are too. For the audience, if you have questions, place them in the Q&A box. You're welcome to do this at any time. No need to wait until the end of the, the webinar. Um, we will uh, be addressing those questions at the end, maybe some of them throughout. So please go ahead and submit those questions whenever you think of them. Without further ado, let's jump on in. Tom. Can you start us at the beginning? Can you explain how ranked choice is used throughout the Oscars process, from the shortlist to the nominations and then the eventual Best Picture winner? You bet, no problem. Happy to help uh, give kind of a general overview. Um, so, you know, historically with the, the, uh, the Academy, uh, you have 10,000 Academy members. They are industry professionals in the, in the film industry uh, in a variety of disciplines and branches is what they call the terminology where they're all in a different branch within their membership. So, uh, you know, actors, writers, directors, cinematographers, sound, music, documentary, animation, all kinds of variety of, of different artists and, and industry professionals uh, in worldwide, not necessarily just confined to Los Angeles. It's definitely become more and more of a global organization. So these 10,000 members are the ones that are voting to then determine eventually who gets nominated, who ends up winning the Oscar, right? But the process of that is a year long process uh, that we go that when I was working for the Academy, we would 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 facilitate. I worked at the Academy, we facilitated that. Um, so the Oscar voting process, there's three different rounds. And so I can kind of go through each one, just kind of give a little overview and, you know, obviously let me know if there's anything more you want me to, to further, uh, you know, expand on. Uh, but within there, there's 23 awards categories. 10 of those categories have a first round of voting, which is the preliminary round that occurs in December. And there's always a, an announcement in December of shortlists uh, being announced for those 10 categories. Uh, those are you know voted on by the different uh, you know experts in those fields. Uh, some of those some of those categories have branches associated with that then are the ones voting for those non those shortlisted achievements. Uh, some of those categories, such as international feature film, isn't tied necessarily to a specific branch. So in that case, uh, th that all Academy members are you know eligible to opt in and participate. They have to watch a certain number to vote, but you know they all vote and participate in December to come up with those shortlists, okay? So then from there, those are some categories, but for all 23 categories in January is when the nominations voting occurs. And that's when each of the branches that those members and those specialties are the ones voting to determine the nominations that are then announced in January. Then when we have the finals voting, which is voting on who wins the Oscar in each category, that is when it's open to the entire 10,000 members that then vote on the winner in every category, all 23. Um, with shortlist and nominations voting, in those two rounds, that's where you're using proportional ranked choice voting. So that's, as you, as you were mentioning, um, that's where the uh, members are each individually voting for their top achievements of the year and ranking them one through five or one, it, one through 10 or one through 15, depending on, on the shortlist uh, rounds of voting. But in both shortlist and nominations, 
in December and January, that is when we the Academy members are voting through proportional RCV. Uh, when it comes to the finals voting then that's taking place, just finished and it's going to be announced on March 10th, that is where uh, for Best Picture, when it's 10 nominees, that is when for the entire membership, they then rank their films in preferential order on their ballot. And that is and that process of, of the ranked choice tabulation is how the Best Picture winner is determined. Um, anything more on the process of those steps that you think I should expand upon? I'd love to hear more about the benefits of using proportional RCV. So it sounds like those first two stages, the shortlisting mm -hmm. and the nominations are use the proportional form. So can you tell us about the benefits of using proportional RCV there? And then tell us about your efforts to expand it while you were with the Academy. Sure, yeah, happy to. So I think what's really, what I really enjoy, what I really respond well to why I like, I like that process is that it ensures that all the films moving forward, both for shortlist and for nominations, are uh, films that received a first place votes as people thought, that, voters thought that that was the best of the year for them. That was their ultimate winner, the best film that they saw. So every step of the way, you're ensuring uh, both the passion vote of the first place vote, but it's also in you, what you're, you know, through that process, you're getting different perspectives from different portions of the voting membership of that voting body in that category. So, you know, as I've, you know, over the years that I was at the academy, we, you know, the the voting process has had different types of voting tabulation systems at different times. Um, but when I was there, I saw the direct benefit of what the RCV. Uh, tabulation process was a, I saw the, the the benefit of that voting system in particular because you were able to get those different perspectives um, when other systems were used that maybe it were, you were f film members could vote down against a film or vote you know score a film lower or th that always felt uh, you know just personally I always felt that that was a little uh, problematic from my perspective. Uh, but, uh, you know, regardless of that, I think what I think philosophically, why I always have was always championed the art, the ranked choice voting method was that it, it enabled the members to vote the passion vote for their favorite vote for other alternate selections too. So they're not just voting for one, they're voting for multiple, but at the same time, there wasn't a process where members could vote down films. And I think that was something that I really resonated and with folks and, and people understood that, like, you know, you're voting on art, art is subjective. You know, there are different films that people respond to in different ways. And so rather than a, having a method where films could be voted in, in the negative against something, it was about shifting it to being more about voting in the affirmative, voting for the ones that you love, the ones that you respond to, and being able to put some really hard thought into it too. You know, you instead of just saying, yes, I like all these films, you have to decide the order. You have to put real thought in like, okay, what's my, what is my favorite? What is my number one? What am I gonna put two, three, four, and five? And I, you know, I think that that, that extra time that it takes for, mem you know, the voters to have to think about their choices is 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 really great because you know that they have, Thought, thought about it when they're before they submit their ballot. So um, that's some of the reasons why I was always a big proponent of it while I worked there and still am, obviously. <laughs> that's great. I, I love that that attitude of yours that you want folks to proactively support a film that they love or films that they love rather than mm -hmm. putting down films that maybe someone else loves. I think that's wonderful. Good. Yes, I agree. Thank you. <laughs> We're aligned. <laughs> so the third step, so those first two steps are proportional RCV. The third step is single winner RCV when they actually select the best picture winner, where of course there is just one winner. So in a moment, I'm going to ask you to talk through some of the benefits of using RCV for that. Uh, but first, I actually want to show a short video about the process that I think will uh, help us out. And I understand, Tom, you might have had a hand in helping create this video a couple years ago. Yes, I definitely helped. I was one of the people on the team that helped produce to get this made, uh, working with a bunch of great people to, to to bring this to life. But it was something we wanted to get out there when we when I was working at the Academy, we wanted to really help just something quick and easy for people to be able to understand how the voting process works. 
Amazing. Well, I will go ahead and uh, share this video real quick. This will take just a little over a minute. When Academy members fill out their Oscars ballot, they use a voting system that employs the fairest possible outcome for nominations and for who wins the Oscar for Best Picture. It's called ranked choice voting, otherwise known as preferential voting. Here's how it works. Let's imagine we're trying to pick the best movie snack. We've got popcorn, candy, chocolate, and soda. Each voter will rank the snacks in order of preference starting with their favorite, followed by their second, third, and fourth choice. Once all of the first choice votes are counted, if a snack receives a majority of the votes, it's automatically the winner. If no one gets over 50%, in a winner-take-all system, candy would still win. But in a ranked choice system, the snack with the fewest votes is eliminated. So if soda was your first choice, your vote now goes to your second choice. Hmm, still no winner. Let's eliminate the next snack and redistribute its votes. Uh-oh, the second place choice on this ballot was already eliminated. Let's take their third choice instead. Good thing they completed their full ballot. This process continues until one snack reaches 50%. Yay, we have a winner. Popcorn. The majority has spoken. I think that's such a great uh, great video. Um, congrats to you and your uh, former colleagues over there for putting together a nice, concise video to explain how this works. Um, so let's hear from you again, Tom, about using RCV to select that best picture winner. Um, I understand you were not in a senior role yet at the Academy in 2009 when they started doing this, but can you tell me a little bit about why it was adopted and how it's worked since adoption? Sure, happy to. So I think, uh, you know, there was obviously, you know, plenty of things written about the decision in 2009 to expand the best picture lineup that folks can look up and, and read about. Um, I will just say when that was decided upon, that was also, you know, the Academy Board of Governors uh, voted to expand the best picture lineup to 10 films. And along that, you, utilizing ranked choice voting in the vote in the vote for that category for that category then for finals and the reason being is of course like if you have 10 films then you're going to have a lot of different votes across the board and you know let's say you, it was evenly matched i mean that they could be 10 percent each film could get 10 percent and you could have a film winning with you know 12 percent 15 percent or or any sort of you know uh a lower percentage than what was desired and so the decision was really that you wanted to ensure that you had a majority consensus of your voting members in support of your eventual best picture winner uh i think the some key history to know is also is that back in the 1930s and the early 40s there were 10 nominees for Best Picture back then as well. So it was returning back to uh, something, um, something that had already been you know, utilized in, in Oscar history, but also at that time, they also used a ranked choice ballot at that time when you had the 10 films. So it was returning back to that uh, method, um, you know, and you want it, you know, and, and so like there's all kinds of different examples that, you know, you can look at, but I, I think, you know, what I've tried to clarify for folks is, is that if, you know, they, they, you know, distribute all the ballots based on first place votes initially. And if a film reaches past that 50% mark on the first ballot, then they're the winner right then and there. It's only if a film doesn't get to that 50% is when they're, then they do the process elimination and re, re, retabulation process, which I know you all know very well, but I, but I, I, um, you know, sometimes you might have a year where you'll have three really three or more films that are all neck and neck and you don't quite know where the best picture win is going to go. And so if you had three films that all had 30%, you know, it'd be really interesting to then, you know, as they do the process of elimination to then retabulate and see which, you know, that's when, you know, that there could be a film that gets across the line based off of the um, um, tabulation process. Wonderful. Um, I think one of the things that's been really interesting is the wide range of types of films that have won Best Picture since RCV was introduced. Uh, consider Moonlight, 
Parasite and Coda, these are all very different types of movies. And so what does that tell you about how the system is working? Well, I mean, it, 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 there's many factors as to why certain films win in a given year, of course. Uh, but I do think that uh, have ensure, having the process ensure that the, 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 the film with the broadest consensus choice of the overall membership uh, you know, it, 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 having that process in place shows that, you know, sometimes different types of films win at different times and it's, and it's not there, it's not the same type of film. I think that's a really interesting, like you, you notice, you notice the patterns. I think it's very interesting how, you know, it isn't the same type of film every year kind of winning. And I, you know, and that's a, again, a variety of factors, but I do think that it shows that by having the ranked choice voting process in place, it ensures that you're, you know, that, that broader consensus um, ha can have a variety of, of winners. It's not, um, it's not just the standard every year. I think we've seen that transfer to politics as well in places that use ranked choice voting. It, it doesn't favor any one particular party or ideology, uh, but it means that we'll elect the candidate who best matches what those voters in, in that district or that state were asking for that year. So I, I think it's a it's a nice way of looking at this this translation of the Oscars voting into the voting in the in politics. Right. Agreed. Speaking and I think yeah, go ahead. You <laughs> I was gonna pivot. This speaking of politics, um, I think you were also involved in bringing RCV to elections for the Academy's Board of Governors, right? Can you tell us what is the Board of Governors and why that change was made? Oh, sure. Uh yeah, the Academy's Board of Governors is basically their elected representatives from each of those branches. So I mentioned, you know, there, the different branches of the Academy. Uh, there's now 19 branches uh, in the Academy and each branch has their own representation on the overall Board of Governors. So I kind of liken it's like the United Nations of film is basically what I view it as. And it, so you have such different, you know, experiences and perspectives and that's the, that's the, the, the you know, the fun of it. And that's the, the uh, it, you know, it's such an, a great, interesting group of people um and and it, and so with that you have you know different representatives in different terms uh that different elections each year that you know reconfigure the the, the board of governors um so i think with that we there were some reforms made uh, around 2020 and one of those changes was to implement rcv as the voting method for their elections. Uh, previously, it was a plurality voting system. So this was really shifting it to doing the ranked choice ballot uh, you know, for a variety of factors. But, you know, part of it was, you know, we're using this for the, at the time, the conversations were, of course, this is the system used for best picture winner. This is the system used for nominations. It should be consistent and also to be for governance elections. Um, and, and then, uh, you know, when we started implementing that, there was a, there were some other reforms made as well. But you know, essentially, became a female majority board for the first time in its history upon the implementation of ranked choice voting. Uh, you know, that that was a really amazing uh, thing to see happen. That's wonderful. Uh, one of the things that we've seen in uh, public elections is that voters really do engage with the ranked ballot, meaning people really do use multiple rankings. They understand how to use those rankings. So some people may rank every single candidate. They get really into it. And others may just rank their top two or three and call it a day. Um, how have Academy members engaged with ranked choice voting? Yeah, I, th I think what's interesting, to, you know, thinking on this, you know, I think for a lot of Academy members, when they join the Academy, that, you know, this might be the first time they use ranked choice voting. So I think just been working on it, trying to help explain how it works, how to approach it as a voter. Um, you know, there might be few that have to get, that might have used ranked choice, but there might have some that have. But for a lot of times, it's helping people understand what it is and that, you know, they don't have to over, like, I think sometimes people think they have to be overly strategic in how they fill out their ballot. And I and what I we've always tried to emphasize is that, you know, it actually you should vote your vote for the films you love in the, how you truly feel, regardless of whether something's perceived as a front runner, regardless as whether you, you know, you think someone something has a chance or not, that this enables you to as the voter to be able to vote your conscience, vote your true uh, you know 
you know, and and be able to vote for multiple candidates, obviously, not just one. And you can vote, you could rank them, and then you know that gives that gives them more freedom to be able to to just totally express their their views on the films versus overly thinking about it or trying to be strategic or or letting other factors like that influence when it should really be about the art that they're responding to. Um, so that's been a, a, a you know, that's been a, a great experience just trying to help with that process. I mean, obviously, you know, it, it, it's a new if it's new to somebody, it's obviously takes some time to help explain and, and you know, that kind of thing. But I, um, I, you know, it's obviously been something that we've been continuing when I was there, I should say, the Academy is continually to implement and expand. What are some of the common questions that you would get from Academy members about how ranked choice voting or how the counting worked? And that's a question from an audience member. Okay. Uh, well, I would say, you know, there's obviously sometimes some film, some members might have a film in the running themselves and they, you know, want to vote for it obviously, but they don't want to, yeah, I think sometimes there's a misconception that they only should vote for the one and leave the rest blank. Uh, I've definitely heard that over the years, and it's something that I've had to clarify that that doesn't help your film more, and it doesn't hinder, it doesn't hinder any other films more. It just, it lessens your contribution as a voter from in, having input on the overall results. And so that's been something I think has been a common misconception that I've just noticed that I think people are used to just voting for the one uh, in you know so many different ways. And so I think it's just a, a change of mindset. Do you ever see particular strategies that people employ to, to make the most of our CV if, if they're campaigning for a film, like campaigning for first choices and backup choices, like rank us second or anything like that? Um, I don't know. That, I don't know how much I've been privy to on some of those aspects. Uh, just to be honest, as you know, while working there, I was very much, you know, in, in more of a neutral space. So I wasn't necessarily always aware to, of some of that degree. But I, um, I think what I what I think is interesting, of course, that this is what translates to obviously electoral politics is that you need to appeal to a broad you is not just attacking. It's not just against others. It's about you appealing to a broader uh, population. So you're not uh, like, like, as you know, like you, you, it's not in your best interest to try to be against a, your competition. It's more about wanting to have a more broader uh, appeal. Awesome. Uh, a note for audience members, uh, we've already started taking a couple of the questions and mixing them in. So please keep those questions coming. We've got a lot of good ones already. Um, so for Tom, uh, maybe I'm looking for some, some lessons for reformers here. Um, I, I imagine that after 96 years, the Academy would be a traditional organization and it could be difficult to change some of its processes, but it is happening. So what lessons, if any, do you think you can share with reformers who are running up against similar issues and advocacy efforts, whether they're trying to pass a bill through a state legislature or get a local editorial board from a local paper to endorse RCV or anything else? What kind of lessons might reformers be able to take away from the successful changes that you all have made? Uh, well, fair. I mean, I, I, you know, it, it, it's very much, you know, it's a uh, year by year, step by step is kind of how I would approach it. You can't come in and just expect to like make a whole bunch of changes overnight. It's really got to be a, what I've learned over, you know, I was there for almost 16 years. So I learned, you know, it's like a year by year process. So if you're wanting to make some changes or reforms, it's really a three to five year plan. It's not just a simple here's everything that needs to be and we're going to pass it, right? That's not realistic. You have to really, uh, you know, st work at uh, being strategic on which steps are more, uh, which steps are going to be easier to get, uh, you know, consensus on and approval on at an earlier stage and which ones might be ones that you would be great to address or bring up as an idea to consider, but you have to wait not necessarily wait, but you just have to have a sense of when is going to be the right time to present it versus just jumping the gun too early. That's kind of what I saw, because obviously, you know, I, you know, when I started the Academy, we had, you know, I always say we had paper submissions, DVD shipments and film canisters, and we transitioned to online streaming and our online streaming platform and online submission process, you know, changing and, and updating voting systems accordingly. Uh, as we've already discussed. So there was a lot of, I was there during a lot of change that was happening at the organization, 
but you you it wasn't like a, you came in in first year you're like okay here we go here's all the things that need to change it's really like you have to kind of think on it and actually i think that's what made it better because then by the time some of i may i was able to, you know to some of the things i may have advocated for for some changes I really had seen had years of experience to point to to see why it would be better versus just at the onset. I, you know, I, I think it was really informative to to it really helped at looking back on it. I see clearly how like having those years and being able to chip away at certain things year by year. And and again, like some of the changes that need to be made, I didn't know them initially either, right? The the process of going there in the three to five, you know, the multiple years process helped you see kind of over time, oh, this is what we really what really is needed here. Um, I didn't know all those answers at the beginning too. You know, I wouldn't have been able to be as effective, I think, if I hadn't if only been there a couple of years um, and and try to implement, try to push too fast. Because the other thing is, of course, is like, you know, we have a board of governors, each branch that I mentioned in the 19 branches, they all have their own branch executive committees that are made up of members from those branches. And they have their own, you know, history and culture and community. And so you have to learn, understand those communities to really know what is feasible, what is really important to them, and then figuring out where can you meet in the middle. I, you know, I I really yeah, so anyways, that I know that's a little bit of a longer answer for you, but but it was but it just kind of, you know, it, it's something I really learned over those years of of being able to to you know, to to just put in the the time to really get to know people to really understand them so that they they could understand where you were coming from. I don't I don't know. I hope that was helpful, but <laughs> that is so helpful. I really appreciate the detailed answer on that. It, change can be hard, and I think we run into exactly the same scenarios doing advocacy work to get this into political elections. It can be. Uh, a, a long strategy, multi-year strategy, where you've got to build the ground game, and you've got to you've got to learn as you go, and engage with a lot of different stakeholders in the process. So that was so helpful. Thank you. Okay, good. All right, thank you. Yeah, no, I, and I think just just understanding where people are coming from. So like, even if they don't agree with you initially, there's it, it kind of builds builds it builds on over the years that then they they eventually might you know you you earn their trust over time, right? So. Yeah. Well, to ask a uh, dramatic question here, I wonder if we can talk about some Oscars controversies. Um, I, maybe you have in mind uh, some some thoughts on recent Oscars controversies, and if they have anything to do with ranked choice voting and, and how those how those interact. Well, I, I mean, what I was, you know, what I, just connecting the dots to what I was just talking about with, like, you know, being able to look at. At, move, at how to move, you know, when you're working in an organization or any sort of entity and how to move forward. You know, when Oscar So White happened, that was a real pivotal moment. But, you know, obviously the, you know, the Academy responded uh, in that moment with their A2020 diversity initiatives and a lot of other measures. But I will say that, that that Oscar So White was the opportunity that got us, that got the organization to be able to move forward on, on some really, all, you know, great reforms that I was really proud to be a part of. And so um, I guess the, the key is, is I think along those lines is, is sometimes those controversies or, or even, you know, some disappointments or things that might seem like a setback can actually be something that you can utilize to then help move something else forward. So it's kind of like, Learn. You have to. You know. You don't know in the moment until it happens, and then you have to kind of say, okay, well, what what could we find here that could be the silver line that could move forward? And I mean, and, and I'm and I'm talking more broadly in a lot of different ways, but specifically with Oscar So White, you know, that was a moment where uh, then the Academy was able to respond with a, a diversity initiative and set goals that by 2020, that was in 2015. So by 2020, would double the number of uh, diverse and women uh, members in the academy. And so a lot of that was a great opportunity to be able to be proactive. And, uh, you know, there were so many uh, artists around the world that didn't know that they would, would, would qualify or be eligible to be an academy member. They didn't know someone in the organization so that they could get sponsored to become a member. So it was really a great, exciting opportunity to be proactive and work with all of our different committees of members to really look at other, you know, look broadly and be proactive and invite people to join. And that was really the, 
and the change that was really exciting. So again, that was a lesson that I learned from that was something that's really tough and a hard controversy, you can actually utilize it to really make a good step forward. Um, so I, 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 you know, that was really exciting. And so then along those lines, you know, over the years, then that's where, you know, right choice voting, uh, implementing, you know, increasing through the membership diversity initiative, increasing our membership, you know, the academy membership. Uh, it was, you know, from like 5,000 members when I started to now 10, 000, over 10,000 members today globally, but what definitely more of an international membership. And, you know, a lot of the governance reforms as far as implementing ranked choice voting, implementing, uh, you know, term limits for, you know, committees. And there were a lot of different, you know, reforms that were able to be possible because of some, you know, in, you know, things that happened that caused, you know, controversy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so, Tom, I, I did warn you that our audience today would be real election nerds. So I'll pivot to a question that I've seen come up in the chat by three different attendees. Um, okay. Do you know what uh, what software is being used to tabulate these ranked ballots? So who is doing that tabulation? How are the ballots being submitted and how are they being tabulated? Great questions. Thank you for asking that because I can give a shout out to PricewaterhouseCoopers, who is the uh, tabulation. Uh, they are the tabulators for the Academy and have been for, for since I think the, the 30s. Um, but they so the uh, voting voting is through the Academy has a voting site, a specific secure voting site where the members use their Academy member log on a uh, login and authentication in order to uh, to log into the voting site. Um, and the votes then are received by PricewaterhouseCoopers. So it isn't so as an Academy staff person, I even though I facilitated, um, you know, I have to facilitated the awards rules, I facilitated the certain categories, and I, you know, the overall awards uh, process, certain aspects of the awards process, myself, I never saw a single member's vote. So for me, I, I was not privy to that information. So I, you know, we were verifying eligibility, we would verify members had seen enough films to be, let's say, eligible to vote in a category that would make them eligible to vote in that category, it would unlock it for them on the voting site. But from that point on, once the member is then in the voting site submitting the vote, that goes to PricewaterhouseCoopers, they receive the votes and they do the tabulation. So I can't speak to their process, but they are, you know, they are, you know, conduct the right choice voting tabulation process. And then therefore they validate uh, either the, the, the shortlist, the nominees or the winners. Do you ever get complaints from Academy members or others about the, the fairness of the system? Th this question came from an audience member who um, I, I know is from Virginia, where they have faced some headwinds from, from opponents who are saying that maybe this method is not a fair way to vote. Do you ever hear anything like that from Academy members? I think sometimes there are other issues that maybe get conflated with the voting system. So, for example, you know, and I don't, it's not something that I want to, I really am uh, able to talk in too much detail, but for example, the amount of campaign or, you know, there's definitely some films that have the backing of very uh, you know, distributors or, or studios that are spending a lot of money on the awards campaign for their films and other films that don't have that kind of backing or with a smaller distributor or self-distributing and don't have the fund, the same level of resources that other films do. I have sometimes seen where that issue, um, which is about, you know, visibility, it's about uh, getting exposure for your films and getting, uh, you know, on, on, on voters radar, whether they're Academy voters or other awards entities that are all part of the awards season, right? There's all these different organizations that vote um, throughout the year, have different nominations and award shows throughout the year too, right? So it's a larger ecosystem of visibility for films. And I, what I have seen is that that uh, imbalance can sometimes be, can I've seen that get misconstrued with the voting system. And I, and I you know, I, I, there's a lot of probably reasons why I think, you know, if, if, if there's a perception that a film has a higher visibility, that it will get, has a better chance of getting nominated. I think that's, regardless of what voting system you used is a reality, right? So I, I I think that's where I've seen there's sometimes larger issues confusing 
the actual system. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> I, I wonder, are there any winners that surprised you um, since they implemented RCV for best picture? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know that I, I don't know that I could comment on that necessarily. I mean, I, I, I think there's obviously, hmm, I don't know in, in, in relation to that necessarily. I think, um, you know, I was really, I'll just say, you know, definitely when Parasite winning Best Picture was quite a, a you know, momentous moment, especially just for like a, you know, a, a film, not, you know, non-English film to win Best Picture, that was a real exciting, you know, landmark moment. Um, and I think it was something we were, you know, definitely, I was definitely proud of, but I, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if that's what you were looking for, but it's just, you know, there's these moments where you can see like, okay, this really was able to be able to show a true reflection. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I already asked you if you, if people have complaints about the system, let me, let me flip that around. Do you hear compliments about the system? Do you hear voters saying that they, they like this better? I think, I think for a lot of voters, it's, it's easier in the sense where they can just focus on like when they're watching all their films, they can just focus on, okay, what are my favorites? What are my favorites? What are really, what's really getting to the top of my list that are my favorite films. And then, you know, they're watching movies all year, right? So I think it it's easier for the voter to be able to just kind of like, they don't have to keep track necessarily of, of you know, if they, if they didn't love the film, that's not gonna be on their ballot. Like they don't need to, you know, it doesn't really need to be more complicated than that. So I think in some ways, once I think, I think that simplicity is helpful um, because you're just voting, looking for your favorite films of the year. That's really at the end of the day, all you're doing. Nice. And, and so when it comes to Best Picture and there are 10 nominees, how many do people get to rank? Do you get to rank all 10 or are people limited to five or something? You can rank all 10. So if you want, if, if you can put, you can rank any four from one to 10 on the ballot. So you can move, you know, and, and it's one, and what I do love about it is it's one where you can move around. So you can, you can put them in order and then change your mind and, and you can kind of fluctuate around with, you know, fluctuate on with the order until you hit submit, right? So it's what's good for the voters. It helps them visually be able to see how they're ranking them. And uh, you could you don't have to rank all 10. Like if there's a couple of films you really dislike and you don't want to rank, you can you don't have to put them on there. You could rank one through seven, one through eight, what have you. Um, but I think it's a, you know, I think that's what's we, you know, the, the sorry, the Academy uses online voting. So I think that's where it's an online online page where you're able to do that. I think what's hard is obviously in paper vote, paper ballots that you all probably work with. Like it's, you know, it's the, you know, it's not as, uh, you know, able to move around as easily. Okay. And, and so that's for best picture where you've got 10 nominees for some other categories that have a smaller number of nominees. They don't use ranked choice voting yet. Right. Do you think that maybe they ever would? Um, I don't know about that, and I don't know that I can really uh, theorize on that. I think it was more that when it came to implementing Best Picture, when you have ten, or like in the short list when you have ten or fifteen, or or like for some categories that don't have a short list, you know, they're voting from there's like three hundred films or so every year that qualify. So they're going from three hundred films down to five nominees. Um, so the focus has really been on when you have the larger number of potential, you know films, uh, that's when you use uh, the ranked choice. Um, you know, we'll see how that evolves, but that at least has been the reasoning. Great, thank you. Um, we have more amazing audience questions. Folks, we have about five minutes left, so we're gonna take a handful more of these questions and keep them coming. These have been wonderful so far. Um, one of our attendees asks, do the voters get to see the tally the, and the sequence of eliminations to, to get to the winner? So, so no, I think that's another misconception too. I think that, thank you for asking that actually, because a lot of the, you know, all, every individual member votes, they submit their ballots for both, nomin you know, shortlist, nominations, finals, what have you. They submit their vote, it's received, and then the nominations are announced and that's when everyone is finding out. So it's, and, and when the, and for the Oscars, when they open that envelope, that's what everyone is finding out. So the reality is, um, you know, the members are not, aware of that. So I think that's one thing that I also think is is a misconception is that when nominations are announced, I think 
a lot of times it's perceived that the entire Academy membership agrees with these nominees. That's not the, that, that just isn't the case at all, because the reality is it's, it's getting, you know, the, the, the preferences of a, a variety of different groups of people that have very different opinions. And so, you know, a lot of times I hear from a lot of members that are like, don't necessarily agree with all the nominees, but you can tell that like at least one of their, at least one, if not more of their choices probably did get nominated. So it's, it, but they all find out the not all the members find out the nominees just as the rest of the world does. So it is not something that uh, people are privy to. It is completely confidentially received and tabulated by Pricewaterhouse. Great. Um, have you, so when, when the nominees are announced, everyone's in the room and finds out at the same time, there is a lot of enthusiasm and excitement in that crowd. Uh, do you think ranked choice voting has impacted the enthusiasm of the crowd at all? That was another audience question. Um, I don't know about that just because for nominations, just to be honest, like for nominations voting, it's been, the ranked choice has been used since the thirties. So it's been in longstanding, uh, tabulation method for nominations. So I, I, I think it's the thrill of getting nominated or not getting nominated at the end of the day. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, someone in the audience has asked if you maybe have an anecdote from one year, maybe when some close films were competing or a story about how ranked choice has been received by members that, that advocates could use as an analogy, something that we can take to our audiences. Hmm. It might be a little difficult for me to say specifically just because I don't because I, you know, I do think what's interesting is like obviously we the 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 results are not public, right? The, the this tabular by Price Waterhouse and then the winners or nominees are announced. You you're not seeing who didn't get on it, you're not seeing who just missed winning, right? That's part of the mystery and the <laughs> and the fun of it all, of course. Um, as an Oscar history nerd, I, I, yeah, it's always a fun uh, mystery, right? Um, so that's part of that. So I, you know, I think that's a little hard to say specifically some examples, but I, you know, I do think like, um, and, and, and I, and I don't know that I want to say any specific, but I think you could look at, so since 2009, if you look at some of those best picture winners, you look at what other potential, uh, films were in the running. You, I think you can see where you could see different types of uh, consensus choices forming. Um, and I think the examples you mentioned earlier, I think are, are, are perfectly that, um, so. Great. Um, does PricewaterhouseCooper ever provide any analysis, uh, of the, the ballots they got? I know they're not releasing these, these full ballots, but anything like how many, the number of rankings used or anything like that. No, it's it's completely a confidential uh, process. Yeah. yeah, locked in the vault. Good for voter privacy. Tougher for us nerds. <laughs> yes, definitely voter privacy is a good point. And and yes, it is definitely uh, you know it's one where you know even as academy staff, I not was not privy to. So it is definitely you know as as secure and you know such a, a thorough process that they do on their end um, with the tabulation, and they're lovely to work with. I will I'll put it in a plug. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we've got, I think, two other audience questions that I would love to throw your way. Um, first up, could you remind us when ranked choice voting was first introduced to Academy voting? Uh, so nominations voting, I, I don't know that I know the exact year, but it, it was back to the 1930s. So for nominations, it's always been utilized for, for again, for getting the proportional ranked choice voting, you know, where you have multiple winners, right? When you're having the five nominees, the five winners. Um, and I think that is something that you know I didn't really know anything about. I just was like always a, a fan of the Os of Oscar history, and I was you know movie and history and nerd, and um, so being able to work at the Academy and then over the years just really learning about these different voting systems is where I became a real you know it just kind of came to me that like wow this is the best system to use. I I was I, I personally by personal opinion of course, but I I just really saw the benefit of it over the years, and I. Um, really certainly advocated for it where I could and and really helped ex try to help people have tried to help explain it and help explain why it, it's the best reflection of the voting members true favorites you know when there were other systems used I could tell that like people would be there would be like I remember just you know distinct moments where like some of the best films didn't make it and people were like 
I, I heard from more members than not that were baffled by it. And it was a different voting system, right? It, was, um, it wasn't it was ranked choice voting. I feel like when you have, since you utilizing it, you can always, you can see more the, the, the top choices of that voting population. And I think that's been, um, and it's just been something that's been, you know, further utilized. But, you know, since the 1930s, it's been used for nominations. So it's clearly, clearly, clearly working. So. Are there any other reforms that you'd like to see to the Academy's voting process? I understand you're not with the Academy anymore, but are there other, other reforms that you think maybe they should consider? Oh, uh, I, I I don't think that's my role now. I think I'm I'm more uh, wanting to, I appreciate the, the question, but I, I, I I'm not in, I'm not willing to dive into that more. I'm more looking at how can uh, how can you know now that I've learned with right choice voting through the academy, what can I do more to help uh, with with helping explain that and just people being aware that this is a voting met voting tabulation method that can be used in all aspects of life. It doesn't need to just be uh, you know this outlier, and I don't think people realize that the academy has been using it for so long. All right, I've got uh, one more question that you may or may not want to answer. Okay. Uh, would you tell us what was your favorite film this year? Well, you know, I've been I've been so used to being Switzerland, the neutral, uh, you know, the diplomatic role of of all films are created equal and all nominees are created equal. So I don't know that I'll want to start that pattern, breaking that pattern just yet. But you know, uh, certainly have a few that I I love. But I think the best picture lineup in general. Just to you know, truly, I do believe it's it's a, a phenomenal group of ten films, and I think it shows such a variety of different films and filmmaking styles. And you know, you have international cinema in with you know U.S. films, independent films. I think it just it shows why I'm such a fan of it. It just further validates that the uh, that when you see a lineup like that of such a, a different types of strong uh, films. Absolutely. And we will find out in just another week who is the winner. Uh, so that is all that we have for you all today. Huge thank you to Tom for joining me today. It was wonderful to have you. And thank you for the, uh, the audience for coming out today and joining us. Uh, we will be posting this video, of course, on our YouTube and other social channels in the coming day. So uh, check those out. Watch it again if you'd like to, but also please share with your friends, anyone who may be interested in this, and keep an eye out for future videos and more webinars from FairVote. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Tom, thank you again so much for being here. No problem. Thank you for having me and uh, enjoy the Oscars, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.